Thanks a lot, Evelyn. Great story. I think it's very important to, to have your culture uh, uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to benefit from, uh, from uh, um, the, 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 the technologies that are available. There was one question actually in the, in the chat box and it was somebody said, do you have a, an example where the uh, self-assessment for the growth mindset is available? Is there, is there a site? Is there, can, can you refer yeah. to something? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, yeah, we put a little test on the site. I'm not sure if it's taken away, but I can surely sh uh, share it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's shareable. So I will, I will look it up and then uh, I'll share it uh, with Patrick. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Evelyn. Great story yeah. and great that you you took the time to to, to well to enlighten us about what you're doing here in uh, in the Microsoft uh, uh, office. Um, we need one minute to connect to the next speaker, Lurleen Duggan. Uh, she is uh, connecting through Teams uh, to talk about the, the Microsoft Global Cloud Skills journey. Um, so we'll be back in one minute. Well, it might not have been a full minute, but uh, we're still going now to our next speaker. Uh, Lurleen Duggan, Chief Learning Officer of Microsoft Western Europe. She has a great story on, on skilling um, and, and, and uh, uh, like I said in the beginning, skilling is not something that you do one time, but then it needs to be a journey. And she has a great story about that. Uh, she connect, she's connecting through Teams. She can hear me right now, so uh, I'm going to ask her or, or, or uh, say to her that she has the floor. Lurleen, you have the floor and tell us all about it. Thanks, Patrick. I hope everybody can see me okay and that technology is, the wonderful technology that is Teams is um, allowing me to speak to so many of you. So thanks for the warm introduction, Patrick. Um, as Patrick said, my name is Lurleen Duggan. I am the Chief Learning Officer for Microsoft West um, I'm going to share my screen now and in the absence of um, amazing Wi-Fi, I'm also going to turn off my video if that's okay with everybody because the two in my area, I live in the country in Ireland and uh, they may not always uh, work perfectly together. So I do apologize. But um, it was really interesting listening to the previous speakers. I think there's a lot of the content um, that's complimentary that I'm going to talk about today. But, you know, the first thing, I guess, um, you know, I did want to kind of talk about the, the journey of lifelong learning and how it supports digital transformation and how it's really intrinsic to the success of any digital transformation initiative. If we think about Microsoft and, you know, Michelle alluded to it earlier, um, as did uh, uh, the previous speaker, we have... Uh, embraced a culture of learning in Microsoft. And one key step in that journey was creating my role. You know, my role didn't exist. I'm one of those roles that I'll talk about earlier that didn't exist two years ago inside of our organization. Learning was something that people had to do to keep compliant, you know, to stay abreast. We did soft skill training just to make sure that we were relevant in the market. But now we've got a whole other initiative, a whole other wave in the culture to our digital transformation. When I think about digital transformation, you know, it's a topic that everybody's talking about. And, you know, it's an over, it, it, to some extent, it's an overused word, right? People are getting slightly, maybe a little bit exhausted from it. And sometimes we have to ground ourselves in what that actually means. You know, at every level, digital transformation can be a phenomenon and it can make people um, and drive bigger value for organizations. And I'm going to be very personal here because this was a very unique story for me, um, but really plays to, you know, how digital transformation can make a difference to people. But recently and sadly, I lost my aunt to COVID-19. She was one month away from her 100th birthday. I actually buried her last week in a very non-Irish funeral. Um, Irish people tend to do good funerals and we didn't get to do that and it was very very different but one of the challenges that we had through this whole pandemic was that we didn't get to see her she was healthy and fit and well and on the day that they announced that there were no deaths in Ireland was the day that we got notification that she was actually terminally ill and she was probably going to pass away in the next kind of 48 hours 
So that challenge for us was quite unbearable and it was difficult because we couldn't see her. And she was in quite a small um, rural hospital and I took it upon myself to contact the hospital to see could we do a video call through Teams, had they any devices. And the nurse in the ICU was like, oh my God, I haven't a clue, I don't know. So I actually rang the IT guy. I, I got to the administrator in the hospital who put me in touch with this person who in turn said, yeah, OK, maybe I can get this social worker, a young guy who was a social worker in the hospital. And I spoke with him and he said, OK, so I said, I'll send you a link right in Teams if you've got a device to open it and we can get it to my aunt and get to the nurses and maybe we can try and do this call. And we got to do that. Right. And it was you know, a couple of hours before they actually put her kind of into a, an induced coma just to try and let her body fight it. Um, so we got to say our hellos. We didn't kind of focus on goodbyes at that point, but it meant that we had that connection. And the nurses in that ICU afterwards, one of them contacted me and said, I now know what to do. She said, I didn't know that it was that easy. I didn't know that if someone just sent me a link in an email that I could open it on my own phone and hand it to the patient. And that moment like enabled my family to talk to a dying relative. And that was transformative for them and for my extended family, who now kind of, you know, a lot of them may be older and not as technically adept as you would think or need in this current environment. That's a small little pocket of digital transformation that absolutely drives value for us for me as a family member of somebody who's very ill, for the person who's very ill, but for the hospital, the hospital being able to deliver that functionality in the current environment that we're in today, where we can't go into the hospitals to visit sick relatives. That's truly a digital transformation moment. And one that, you know, I think when we hear digital transformation, it can be a little bit exhaustive and we just need to open it back and think, actually, it can be small steps, but small steps can make a big difference. When we think about digital transformation, then and we move into that kind of, you know, what does that really mean? You know, 91 percent of leaders see digital transformation as a way of sparking digital and uh, to kind of that transformation, innovation and finding efficiencies. And some companies are embracing a digital transformation journey and they feel really excited about it. And we can see, and you know, Michelle alluded to Maersk earlier, a customer that, you know, my team um, across Western Europe work with very closely. And Stephanie will talk about those scenarios later in her presentation around, you know, how to build a training plan with an organization. But just last week, I did a call with Maersk who, you know, are moving 3,600, skilling 3,600 of their, their IT pros on GitHub, right? And we're partnering with them on that platform, on that exercise. So we've seen those really good, you know, kind of uh, uh, focused companies. But we've also seen the and acknowledge that for some, the whole topic is causing tension. And there are some legitimate concerns about getting digital transformation right. And in truth, future success does depend on making the transition. 64% of organizations feel that if they don't do it, they may not be here in four years time. That's a big number, it's a big statistic. But let's take a little step back for a moment because there are some things that can help demystify the whole topic a little bit and help you to think about it differently. You know, I believe that kind of, if we look at all of the research that we have here, you know, the one cornerstone of a digital transformation is, and, and, and of any company, is how you create and generate value. Generating value, you know, regardless of your industry, every organization is trying to do it, to drive that constant value generation. It's been the way since the first business or organization of any kind was formed, right? Henry Ford, when he built that car, he built it, you know, at that base level that he needed to, 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 to deliver value to his audience. You know, later he introduced color because, wow, the customer needed color. If he'd held the line and said, no, we're only going to do black, other companies would have surpassed them and nearly did. And so the purpose of digital transformation is very simply a process to help your organization find new ways of generating value. And perhaps the greatest mistake or trap that we see time and time again is that companies try to create new value by looking at technology for the answer. 
technology is not always the answer. It's the support to get you through that. But you have to look at really what is the you what how will the use of more technology see things improve? I look at our organization and, you know, we talk about the culture of learning um, in in Microsoft. And there for me, there are four pillars to help any organization that's kind of embracing a digital transformation journey. And there are four those four pillars are the key ones that stand out for me to look at your vision and strategy, to look at your culture What's the unique potential of your organization and what are the capabilities of your organization? They're the foundational elements. If you know those and you've got a very clear vision, then you can really move forward successfully. We live this in Microsoft. I am so proud and I know that um, uh, we've, you, you've seen the, the Satya Nadala, you know, to empower every person and organization to do great things, you know. A vision and a strategy really is what sparks that kind of innovation and that passion to to drive. I see it myself as chief learning officer, you know, to have the mandate to go and talk to people like yourselves about learning and about the impact that learning can have in an organization is truly a privilege. But I know without any doubt that my leadership team is completely behind me. Vision is perhaps like for me, it is certainly the most important. It's what directs successful organizations towards that single North Star. The vision is fully articulated in the strategy and it tells everyone kind of surrounding the organization what you're truly working towards. And in every case, the organizations have a vision that tap into human ambition and spark imagination. The vision and the strategy is key to making the roadmap which clarifies how will realize or work towards a vision. Um, you know, the the as I said earlier, you know, the chief learning officer role didn't exist. But as such as started to look at our company internally, as we started to look at transforming our workforce to make them more technically skilled, because that technical agility is what our customers rely on us for. It's what sparks maybe a HR director to go, oh, I never thought of that. When somebody from a sales perspective has a conversation about an opportunity that they may have in the future, BDMs don't often know or understand the value or the potential that can be um, that can be leveraged to help them to innovate their business. The second one for me is the culture, right? The culture that keeps teams connected, elastic and invites change. Again, we see organizations that are best able to go through a transformation when people inside it are unified and working with shared values and ideas. They have a culture that keeps their team connected and key for a transformative process is elastic enough to respond to changes or challenges as they come up. But that can contract then and get back to the core and and continue to learn and to innovate. We notice that organizations whose culture continually invites change and accepts the diversity of personalities, ideas and approaches require drives and drives that organization forward. I mean, we're encouraged in Microsoft as part of our one to one kind of manager to direct report process to articulate moments where we've actually taken content from others or taken learning from others and applied it to our job or where we've developed something and shared it with others so that they don't have to repeat the the exercise or make the mistakes that we made on that journey. So this culture of sharing is core to, it's a core tenancy to our role inside of Microsoft. Thirdly, looking at your unique potential and unique potential that unlocks and amplifies and it creates value. Every organization has a set of unique assets, right? That's what makes them kind of drive their business. And what we, you know, traditionally known, I guess, as as core competencies, things that have the potential to be leveraged to differentiate themselves. But the art here is to find the specific thing that can unlock potential in a different way, a single pivot point. And that unique potential can be found in a variety of forms. And depending on the industry and the, and the organization, it can manifest in different ways. You know, for some, it might be found, 
you know, in their physical assets, like we'll say a retail location and proximity to its customers. For others, it might be a specific IP or for others, it could be the way their workforce is deployed. There's a that's where the magic lies, like where an organization can uncover or rethink what it has to see it as a unique potential and then figure out how to leverage or amplify the value it creates. This is prime. This is really a prime area where technology and skills can help unlock value. It's the process of shifting from what you have today to what you can become in the future. And you cannot make that journey without skilling, without learning. The last piece then is capabilities that enable organizational transformation. So first off, you know, in any change management program, and you think about risk and risk and and moving through that process, understanding your existing capabilities is really important, right? The, we see organizations that do best are thinking about and continually developing a wide range of capabilities. They're on a journey of looking at their human kind of capabilities, their human capital capabilities. You know, do they have the right people with the right skills? Are they helping them grow? Do they have a plan for a particular set of roles and how that role may evolve? They look at operational capabilities, you know, the processes and tooling that enable people to execute in the right way and at the right speed. This is, again, a huge opportunity from a technology perspective. And then they think about, of course, technical capabilities. And this is about ensuring that the the appropriate technology that's deployed so that the teams have what they do to to, to have have what they need to do great work. But today, more than ever, successful organizations are looking at their AI capability. And AI, you know, is something that certainly inside of Microsoft, we're really focusing on and building our own internal muscle because we know from all of the IDCs and the Gartners, we know that we're heading for, you know, a wave in 2022 where we'll have a skills gap in the market that's going to cost us a lot of money. And that's going to cost a lot of companies a lot of money. And, you know, Microsoft is, you know, a, a proponent of of and uh, embodies, you know, the trust um, mandate. And I think our, you know, our chief legal officer, Brad Smith, when he talks, he talks about, you know, being Microsoft being the valued partner when it comes to trust. And I think as we look at AI, we will have that North Star front and center for us. But to sum up, We believe the essence of any digital transformation is fundamentally very simple. Its purpose is to generate value. And it's achieved by focusing on the people within your organization first and then working to empower them with the right technology, enabling them to create more, do more, solve more. It's people plus technology. Technology is just the tool, but the people are the focus and, the, and more value is then the outcome. I love this quote. Um, if we're going to grow, we have to change. And if we're going to change, we have to learn. We have to learn. You know, our, our you know, working with um, Patrick and CompuTrain and across the whole LLPA network over the last year, you know, we've stood up my team. I have a very new team, a team of training program managers who, you know, work with our customers on building comprehensive skills plans in partnership with our learning partners. And Stephanie will talk about this later. But I think the companies that we see aggressively go after learning are the ones that are driving transformation inside their organizations that are seeing kind of their cloud adoption accelerate at speed. Um, And, you know, Michelle said it earlier, Mayor are a great example of that today. But we can't forget that digital transformation requires new skills. Um, You know, when you've got efforts underway for kind of, we see it across enterprises worldwide. And in the journey, these companies are finding the need to an enhanced set of skills and knowledge to thrive as a digital company. Jobs exist in today's economy that didn't exist three years ago. I'm one of them, right? I am one of those people. And skills required for any job continues to evolve. The average life cycle of a skill that you learn today is five years. Great news for learning partners, great news for for Microsoft. But if you're a CEO, then you're really thinking about retaining talent, about emerging talent, about growing that talent. And I'll talk about that in a moment. 
But if you have, you know, that that digital transformation initiative, you want to innovate more, you want to be more competitive and you want to grow your business and skills build confidence. Confidence drives productivity, innovation and growth. You know, we all love to talk about subjects that we're really confident about. And you can only build that confidence by teaching people and giving them the skills that they need. So organizations are looking for better ways to help their employees to get prepared so they can truly perform the roles supporting their business. This survey was taken, you know, from a group of CEOs and it was talent critical to success. Right. That was the perspective. But you can see here that of the CEOs that were polled, 62 percent was the biggest attracting and retaining talent was their biggest issue. And as we think about the next two years and the opportunity that's ahead of us, that's a big ask, because if we don't have the people in the market, if we don't have the technical audiences that are ready for that, that kind of IT challenge that's ahead of us, you know, we will be in trouble. COVID-19, 27 million people in Western Europe have been impacted by COVID-19. And when I say Western Europe, in that number, I'm thinking about the subsidiaries across Western Europe, exclude, which excludes the France, France, UK and Germany. So that's 12 subsidiaries in Western Europe and 27 million people that have either lost their jobs or being furloughed. We have a responsibility in Microsoft to help to get those people moving again, to get them back on their feet. But if you think about the opportunity that that then presents, if we were to say, OK, let's get to 10 percent of that demographic, that's only 2.7 million people. And I say only, I'm not saying that lightly, but but nevertheless, if you're a learning you know, organization, a learning partner, you know, there are organizations, there are individuals out there who need to be retrained so that they can migrate and be relevant in what's to come. Then we've got developing next generation leaders. You know, how do we get the people of today, the talent of today, ready to move? And we've got lots of really bright talents. And I love to hire for talent as opposed to experience. I think that's a really good diversity metric as well. I mean, obviously, you know, we've got all of our diversity metrics, but sometimes talent versus experience because the person coming in developing that next generation of leaders from a CEO's perspective is critically important aligning compensation with performance it's always a challenge and you know a challenge that every kind of CEO you know it it plays right back into that how do you attract and retain talent if you don't have a good method for compensation against performance, then you may lose that talent after investing in enabling them to join your company. And down right down at the list is reducing cost, like reducing cost as an internal metric is the lowest of the four. When we look at the external issues that are highlighted in green, you know, risk of a recession front and center right now for us all with um, the, the pandemic, political instability, not maybe relevant as much in, um, in in Europe. But if you put the lens of China against Europe and the size of those economies, you know, the European Union have a challenge ahead of them to make us more relevant in, the, in that capital market space. New competitors, you know, straight up, it, the, the companies are innovating really, really quickly. And there are new competitors coming into the space all of the time. And then declining trust. And it's a really interesting one, I think, when you think about, you know, CEOs worried about their declining trust with their customers. But what gives, we go back to kind of focus on the retaining talent and, and that focus, you know, we need to think about what gives us energy at work. What does make, what makes our um, employees want to be with us, want to stay with us? Self-actualization, you know, the mission, the purpose, the personal growth, right top up there. Accomplishment, esteem, meaningful work, progression, you know, how and where am I going to get my next job? The opportunity to belong, you know, I, I, I find it challenging right now. You know, I didn't see, I haven't seen my team since December. They're all over Europe. I have a couple that are here in Ireland, but I won't see them. I don't know when I'm going to physically see them again. And that's a big that's a big thing. So I have to kind of consciously do better in that space when it comes to making them feel that they belong. Safety. So flexibility, diversity, inclusion, inclusion, you know, in, in, making sure that everybody is heard, 
you know, making sure that you've got a voice. That's really important when you think about what gives your employees that energy. And then lastly, it's the physical needs, right? The salary, the benefits, the health, the well-being. And now more than ever, you know, I know personally for myself, you know, I work at home. I have children. Sometimes some days I feel like I sleep where I work as opposed to I work where I sleep. You know, the balance can be hard to find, but you have to make that concert, conscious effort. But what matters most if we think about that meaningful work is the nature of the work itself is at 26 percent and the opportunity to learn and grow is at 19 percent. So the two biggest ones can be directly influenced by, you know, the organization, the manager and the investment that you make in that person. Companies that don't invest in skilling, you know, are often considered to to, you know, really just treat their employees as a commodity. And it doesn't have to be expensive either. I mean, you know, skilling and learning can be reading a book or it can be accessing free platforms. I mean, MS Learn, there's a lot of content there, you know, for people to go and actually look at, you know, but that's giving them content. It's not necessarily certifying and there's value in the certification, of course. But if we look at hiring, you know, if we think about engineering as a skill, 11 percent tech engineers growing than non-tech and if you think about this I'm, and I'm talking about the auto industry you know um and I had this conversation with a friend of mine who owns a couple of BMW franchises and we spoke about mechanics and he was like yeah I mean it's more of a keyboard now than it is a screwdriver right and that's going to change those skills and the skill sets that are needed for those mechanical engineers will change but what does the future look like so you know, we, we think about 62 percent of executives believe that they need to retain or replace more than a quarter of their workforce by 2023, a quarter of their workforce. Nobody wants to replace them, but they'd love to retrain them. Right. Seventy percent new jobs will be created, which don't exist now in the next five years. Seventy percent. And then we've got an impact. And I spoke about this earlier. There's an impact of potentially 160 billion if we don't close that skills gap. And I believe that, you know, kind of us as a learning organization and need to really double down and focus on this. But the good news is that 74 percent of our employees are ready to retrain. So generally, people are happy and, you know, enthusiastic about taking that opportunity. So we talk about the CLO, the chief learning officer. We are at a crossroad transforming employee learning and, you know, meeting our customer needs it, we're eight times more likely to be high performers. Think about that. So the employees that you train could potential reach that potential eight times more than they are today. 25% faster at learning skills and they're 66% more engaged. We, we, we internally in Microsoft do lots of employee satisfaction surveys, but we can see that, you know, it's certainly that culture is now becoming the norm. But CLOs, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about appointing CLOs in your organization or you have CLOs or you are a CLO, you know, we really have a choice to take. So we need to move from this trainer focus, focus to being more transformer. So thinking about what's the investment the, co the company needs to make, how we partner in driving those outcomes with, with the different departments that we're continuously adapting and curating content and co-creating with maybe subject matter experts, but fostering capabilities for now and for later. We need to look at goals, developing skills, developing mindsets, the capabilities to help workers perform well now, but adapt for the future, building their skill sets, you know, building the leaders of the future. We need to look at how we do that so that learning is more personalized. It's autonomized for the individual, you know, digitized. Uh, you know, we've seen this lovely transition from in classroom to online. You know, that's a technology. That's a digital transformation in itself. Learner centered, you know, gamification, making it very relevant that people can share their, you know, the, the badges or the certificates that they earn and available when and where it's needed, letting people have a choice rather than mandating and then looking at departments. So learning units are becoming more agile and much more strategic, you know, at that front and center table with other BDM LT members in your organization. Because the one thing that you have got to internalize here, that this is a journey. It's absolutely not a master move. Learning is simply a new way of working. It's not a flick of a switch. It's a slide up 
button rather than a flick of a switch. But it absolutely needs to be considered across all of your demographic as you reach out to embrace that digital transformation. Let us know, reach out um, through Patrick or directly if you want. That's kind of all for me today, Patrick. I'm going to, to hand over to you. Thanks a lot, Lurley. Great, great story. Also, also, this story is very great and good to see how, uh, how you address this, uh, this skilling journey. And I think uh, you've convinced a lot of people in, in the audience uh, that they need to pay a lot of attention on, on skilling their people, looking at the culture and, uh, and, and looking at certification as well. So thanks a lot for that. And now... We are going to take two minutes. We have to change a little bit again here. And then after this session, it's like Lurleen said, Stephanie Straub will be here presenting about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Stephanie is training program manager for the Netherlands and she will talk about the, the, uh, uh, the programs that Microsoft has in place to help you skill your people. So we'll be back in two minutes. Take a bio break, take some coffee and uh, see you in, uh, in a few.